Well, good morning and welcome to Matins on this Wednesday of the third week in Lent. Thank you for being with me this morning. Our scriptures for today are the first half of Psalm 147. That's verses 1 through 12. Uh, we're going to finish Genesis chapter 45 and we will begin 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I'd like us to begin with a word of prayer. Would you please pray with me? Blessed Lord, you speak to us through the Holy Scriptures. Grant that we may hear, read, respect, learn, and make them our own, in such a way that the enduring benefit and comfort of the Word will help us grasp and hold the blessed hope of everlasting life given us through our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall declare your praise. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is near to those who call upon him. O come, let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and raise a loud shout to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods, in his hand are the caverns of the earth. The heights of the hills are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. O come, let us bow down and bend the knee and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is near to those who call upon him. O oh, come, let us worship him. Our psalm is number 147. We're just going to do the first half today. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant it is to honor him with praise. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He counts the number of the stars and calls them all by their names. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. There is no limit to his wisdom. The Lord lifts up the lowly, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make music to our God upon the harp. He covers the heavens with clouds and prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass to grow upon the mountains and green plants to serve mankind. He provides food for flocks and herds and for the young ravens when they cry. He is not impressed by the might of a horse. He has no pleasure in the strength of a man. But the Lord has pleasure in those who fear him and those who await his gracious favor. Let us pray. God, our Father, great builder of the heavenly Jerusalem, you know the number of the stars and call each of them by name. Heal hearts that are broken. Gather those who have been scattered and enrich us all from the plenitude of your eternal wisdom. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis 45. We pick up where we left off yesterday at verse 16. Uh, Joseph has just revealed his true identity to his brothers and uh, wept upon their necks. And after that, his brothers talked with him. Up until then, they weren't willing to, so they were too afraid. And that's where we pick up today. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's brothers have come. It pleased Pharaoh and his servants. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Say to your brothers, do this, load your beasts and go back to the land of Canaan and take your father and your households and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you shall eat the fat of the land. And you, Joseph, are commanded to say, do this, take wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. The sons of Israel did so, and Joseph gave them wagons 
according to the command of Pharaoh, and gave them provisions for the journey. To each and all of them he gave a change of clothes. But to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five changes of clothes. To his father he sent as follows, ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. Then he sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said to them, Do not quarrel on the way. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob, and they told him, Joseph is still alive, and he is ruler over all the land of Egypt. And his heart became numb, for he did not believe him. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, which he had said to them, and when he saw the wagons that Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. And Israel said, It is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to read... Uh, verses 1 through 13, and that is the whole chapter. But this is about food offered to idols. St. Paul writes, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we are all things, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay, so Joseph is now known to his brothers, and Pharaoh hears it. Remember yesterday, Joseph cried. He wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. So Pharaoh knew something was going on. And then the report was heard in his house, Joseph's brothers have come. And Pharaoh was pleased about that. Of course he was. This is... You know, this this Joseph character <laughs> has, has made him look like a great pharaoh because he is taking care of his people. They have prepared for this famine. It's, it has been nothing but good for him, so much so that he has entrusted it all to Joseph. So, and now Joseph's family is here. Great. Go get them. <laughs> Tell your brothers, go, go back and get your stuff and come back here. Get your stuff, all the rest of your family. In fact, you don't even need to worry about your stuff because it can't be as good as what I'm going to give you. Hmm. 
load your beasts, go back to the land of Canaan, take your father and your households, the people, right? Households meaning people, and come to me and I will give you the best of the land of Egypt. So the best properties and the best produce, right? You shall eat the fat of the land. Fat is, you know, I think of prime rib. It's a great cut of meat, but it's really fatty, right? Really fat. This is this is luxurious. This is this is um, what the rich eat, right? You will eat the fat of the land, and you, Joseph, are commanded to do this. This is interesting. You are commanded. His Pharaoh's authority here ensured Joseph's family's welfare. I am telling you, you must do this. Tell them do this tell your brothers do this take wagons from the land of egypt so not just what you brought here's some more here's some of our wagons and take these up there for your little ones and your wives so that you can bring your families down with right because what you have here is just enough for for you men you need to bring your children and your wives down too come down here this famine is bad let me save your whole family Bring your, yeah, for your little ones and your wives and bring your father too and come here. Have no concern for your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. Wow. Luther says, do not let your possessions hinder you. Whatever you cannot sell because of this famine, leave it behind. You don't have to worry. When you come here, you will be well taken care of. And the sons of Israel did so. <laughs> and Joseph gave them wagons according to the command of Pharaoh and provisions for the journey. So they, were, they would be plenty comfortable on the way up and the way back. And he gave all of them a change of clothes. But Benjamin, he gave 300 shekels. That's a lot of money. And five changes of clothes. He has special love for Benjamin. Benjamin is his full brother. The others are half-brothers. They have a different mom. They're still sons of Jacob, but they have a different mother. He did not have any fear of brotherly resentment at this point. To his father he sent ten donkeys loaded with the good things of Egypt, ten female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and provision for his father on the journey. So, here's more for dad. Make sure he gets here okay. And then he sent his brothers on the way. He sent his brothers away, and as they departed, he said, Do not quarrel on the way. Although forgiven, the brothers had to take care not to fall into those kind of sins again. Obviously, they're prone to it, but here, you know, you shouldn't have anything to fight about now. Just go get dad and come back. So they went up out of Egypt and came to the land of Canaan to their father Jacob. Okay? And they told him Joseph's still alive and he's ruler over all the land of Egypt. Do you think that would have been hard for Jacob to hear? So you told me he was dead and now he's alive. Not only is he alive, but he's ruler over Egypt. How does that happen to a Hebrew? How does that happen to one of my kids? He's not even Egyptian. And his heart became numb for he did not believe them. This is such disbelief and shock that he denies the joy of the good news. But when they told him all the words of Joseph, okay, if you don't believe us, dad, listen, this is what happened. They told him all the words of Joseph, which he, Joseph, had said to them, his brothers. And when Jacob saw the wagons that Joseph sent to carry him, Here's 10 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. Bring, bring dad here. When he saw the wagons Joseph sent to carry him, the spirit of their father Jacob revived. His sorrow over the loss of his sons brought him to the point of death. But when he saw that his 11 sons had all come back, Benjamin too, and Simeon who was held captive, and learned that Joseph was alive, it was as though he had come back to life. His sorrow over losing Simeon 
over fear of losing Benjamin and over having lost Joseph all those years before. It all went away and it finally hit him. And then, it, so the spirit of their father Jacob revived. The very next verse, and Israel said, so now it switches his, his name again. And Israel says, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is still alive. I will go and see him before I die. And it gives me a note to look at in the next chapter, because that's the end of 40, chapter 45. So it says there's a note on verse 4. Um, I myself will go down with you to Egypt, and I will bring you up again, and Joseph's hand shall close your eyes. This is God speaking to Jacob. Okay, God spoke to Israel in visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. Jacob said, here am I. Yeah, we'll read this tomorrow. But, um, so the note here is that most people assume that God's had power only in certain places. Here, the Lord showed that he is God over the entire earth, present with his people wherever they are. Um, Jacob would die in Egypt and Joseph would provide honorable burial for his body. Yeah. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. Let me read you the summary of the chapter. <clears throat> chapter 45. Joseph reveals himself, reassuring his brothers. And with Pharaoh's full support, he sends for his father and the whole family. Jacob is finally convinced his son is alive. God rules the world and brings evil to a good end for the sake of his people, just as he did with Joseph's slavery. Let us pursue Joseph's virtues, humility, wisdom, forgiveness, care for parents and family. Let us not quarrel in our Christian journey, but hold fast to the mercy and doctrine that God has revealed. In Christ, our sins are forgiven, and God gives us the joy of reconciliation and new life. Amen. There is a whole lot of richness to that. I hope you heard some of the things that this chapter said. <clears throat> the promise of coming to the one who delivers you, the one who can save you, the one who will feed you when everyone around you is starving. Oh, there's so much there. Okay, let's talk about, so while uh, we're talking about food, let's talk about what kind of food you can't, you shouldn't eat. All right, so in, as I read this, you saw me do this a couple times. Every time I did that is when in the writing it's listed in quotations, okay? Now, there's a preface to chapters 8, 9, and 10. Let me read you that preface. Questions had arisen over whether Christians should eat food that had been sacrificed to idols. This food was eaten in a temple dining room at sacrifices involving actual idol worship, purchased in the marketplace, or eaten in a non-Christian's home. Some in Corinth argued that idols were not real gods, so the sacrifices did not matter and the food could be eaten. Paul agreed the idols were not real. But the decision of whether to eat the food was to be based on the way other people interpreted that action. Because some Corinthians had formerly worshipped these idols and eaten those meals as if that god were present, their perspective shaped by these former associations had to be taken into account. Corinthians' behavior had to be both faithful to our God's commands and loving toward their fellow believers in Christ. This situation is different from Romans 14, where Paul instructs the Romans to stop passing judgment on one another in the matter of what foods to eat. In that context, eating or not eating was simply a matter of preference in a situation for which there is genuine gospel freedom. All right. Concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. All right, this is the first quote. And this knowledge puffs up. Only the person who has it benefits. But love builds up, Paul says. Love guides relationships between Christians, promoting mutual care. So if I'm the only one that really knows knows deep in my heart that, you know, that idol is fake. It's not a real God. It's not a God at all. It's something somebody made up. So it's not a real God. Therefore, it's not really worship. Therefore, the food didn't really do anything in the sacrifice. 
not like Jewish sacrifice. So who cares? It's meaningless. Just it's just meat. Just eat it. Okay. Yes, that is all solid theology. That is a good a good understanding of it. But if anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. Well, that's an interesting thing. Okay, so knowledge that does not result in love is self-delusional and false. So what is it that you think you know? Does it lead you, does what you know lead you to love neighbor? Yeah, I think I'm gonna come back to that. I'm gonna, in fact, I'm gonna have to come back to that because this is super important. Yeah. Knowledge that does not result in love is self-delusional and false. Hmm. If anyone imagines he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Well, there you go. Recognized and received by God is what that means. Therefore, okay, having said all that, whatever you think you know, if you have knowledge but it doesn't lead you to love, then you're inadequate there somehow. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence. This is something that they have said to Paul. He's quoting them. Both the apostle and those who eat idol food in Corinth share a basic knowledge about God and about idolatry. An idol has no real existence, and there is no God but one, capital G God, our God. He's the only one. <coughs> this is common knowledge. This is something they've said to him, and it falls in line with his teaching of them. For although there may be so-called gods, little g, in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, small g, small l. For us, there is one God, the Father, capital G, from whom are all things, he created everything, and for whom we exist, that is our existence as Christians, as children of God, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, God the Father created through the Son, and through whom we exist. Typical Paul long sentence, right? Um, there is only one God. All other so-called gods are merely human creations. Some Corinthians took this knowledge and decided they could eat any food that had been sacrificed to the idols because the idols were not real. So this is this is not just academic this is happening and paul is addressing it okay this is one of the things it was part of what was dividing the church at corinth that was causing the conflict there so we hear this common early christian expression here one god the father from whom are all things for whom we exist and one lord jesus christ through whom are all things and through whom we exist this is like an early creed okay um the sun was active in the creation of life and in the new creation of faith. Right. However, not all possess this knowledge. Not everybody's there yet in their, in their teaching, in their education, in their spiritual growth. Um, this knowledge that idols are nothing. But some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled because they still, they remember that idol worship and they believe that that other God, false though we know him to be, is present there for that. So now they're worshiping another God. Whether that God is real or not, it's the act and it's what's in their heart that's going on that defiles them because now they've committed a sin. You shall have no other gods. Don't make of yourselves a graven image. Don't worship that image. This is a sin. <clears throat> because their moral outlook is not yet firmly grounded in a Christian perspective, these believers have a weak perspective regarding idols. They recall when they themselves worship these very false gods. 
When they see some, someone eating idol sacrifices, they think that such people are worshiping the idol to whom it was sacrificed. They were led to sin because they think they are worshiping an idol. Remember, in Roman culture, it was not uncommon to worship more than one god. You could attend worship in the temple of Zeus one day and the next day go to worship in the temple of Poseidon or Athena or whoever. It was very common. You didn't have to restrict yourself in Roman culture to just one God. Counter to the God of the Jews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The only God we are allowed to worship. So for a new Christian to see that, well, I guess it's okay if I still eat the meat that was offered to Zeus. Apparently we can do that too. Now, not if you believe it is actually Zeus you are worshiping when you eat it. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat and no better off if we do. All right. It is not necessarily wrong to eat the food sacrificed to idols, but eating it is not beneficial because it leads away from God and harms the neighbor. If it, it might not lead me away from God, but it could lead my neighbor away from God if this is what he believes. Here's what um, the Lutheran Confession, specifically the Apology, says about it. The Gospel does not advise about distinguishing clothing and meats and the giving up of property. All right? Some good, some bad, no. If you cause your brother to stumble, don't do it. <clears throat> Take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. The conclusion of those who are strong in the faith is correct. There is no other God, so what is sacrificed to an idol is nothing. But eating this food, even though it is morally defensible, de defensible because there is the, the God to whom it is sacrificed is not real, it may lead others to sin, and that makes it a problem. For if anyone sees you who have this knowledge that these gods are false and not real, if the one who sees you has a weak conscience, if his conscience is weak to eat food offered to idols, will he not be encouraged to eat food offered to idols if his conscience is weak? So. This, again, it's kind of repeating himself. Oh, I guess that's okay. So I guess I can go do that and worship this other God too. And so by your knowledge, because you thought it was okay to eat that food, this weak person is destroyed. The brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Oof. All right. Um, many Greco-Roman temples had what we might consider dining or banquet facilities. Meals were commonly eaten there, particularly for business or social functions like birthdays or weddings. So it was common. This is why it was common. It would happen. And people would see, pe see new Christians eating meals in those temples, temples to other gods. Because the new believer is led to worship what had formerly been considered a real God, this person now breaks the first commandment and is in danger of losing their faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. By nullifying Christ's saving work, sinning against Christ, in the new believer, the strong destroy the weak person's faith and sin against Christ. They have led someone away from Christ. That's why it's a sin against Christ. Therefore, having said all this, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Because I don't want to make my brother stumble. That meat is not that important. What, what might lead someone else to sin and unbelief is avoided in that person's presence. Paul took a different attitude toward those who demand certain practices as a basis of righteousness. Hmm. That's a Galatians 3 reference, but we'll save that for another time. Okay, so 
this is this is how we think have to think about freedom as a Christian. And listen to this summary here. The rights and the freedom of the gospel are wrongly promoted in the Corinthian church, leading the believers to adopt too easily the behaviors and practices of the surrounding culture. No believer has the right or freedom to destroy the faith of others, especially those whom Paul describes as weak in the faith. Faith is not a private matter. Faithful Christians will be zealous to pray for and carry out God's will, that all be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Wow. What we do must not get in the way of someone else's faith. What we do should always bring someone to faith, encourage their faith, grow their faith, not weaken it, not destroy it, not lead them astray. <clears throat> yeah. We should all be thinking about that. What we do in faith, if it has an effect on others, we're called to be in community. Faith is not private. We have to consider the ramifications of that. <clears throat> All right, let's conclude our liturgy. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an overflowing stream. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let justice roll down like water and righteousness like an overflowing stream. Let us pray. Lord, during this Lenten season, nourish us with your word of life and make us one in love and prayer. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy and hear us. Let us now confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. O Lord, I cry to you for help. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Give me the joy of your saving help again and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Let my mouth be full of your praise and your glory all the day long. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Awesome things will you show us in your righteousness, O God of our salvation, O hope of all the ends of the earth and of the seas that are far away. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. He redeems my life from the grave and crowns me with mercy and loving kindness. Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come before you. Let us pray. 
Lord Almighty and everlasting God, you have brought us in safety to this new day. Preserve us with your mighty power, that we may not fall into sin, nor be overcome in adversity. And in all we do, direct us to the fulfilling of your purpose, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now may the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. <clears throat> and that concludes our matins for this Wednesday. Thank you for spending this time in the Word with me. Thank you for giving back to God a little bit of the day He's given to you. Uh, I'll be back again tomorrow. So, same time. And then we'll finish out our week after that. So, again, thank you for being here. And until we can be together again, whenever that is, may God bless and keep you.